our journey is underway now to put a little bit of fence around Annette's property in southeast or corner of Oregon. We go past some mud holes. We get to the trailer house where we'll be staying while we do the fencing and go get to bed that night. The next morning, we get up to a flat tire. So we fixed the tire and made the all-important trip to Whitehorse or Willow Creek Hot Springs just to soak a little bit. Then we go back to the trailer house, do a little bit of work, and we need to make a trip in to Boise or someplace to get that tire fixed. The road is somewhat rutted, so that's why we have a four-wheel drive. It seems like this never gets all that muddy down here where the deep ruts are, so it imposes no problem for the four-wheel drive. As we move on, a buck antelope is out feeding on the tender young grasses of the high plateau. It's important he put on all the weight he can so he can grow big and be one of the tough guys when it comes to the rut late in the summer. As we move on toward Boise, we see two real good dogs riding in the back of the pickup. One of them is brave enough to set right up on the ice chest while the other lays and sleeps. As is common for most dry years, it's a great year for the Mormon crickets and a major migration of them is crossing the highway right in front of us. The, it's just a slow moving migration as they've already cleaned all the vegetation off the bushes, all the leaves and everything are cleaned off is this tremendous horde of Mormon crickets move their way northward. If you don't like crawling and jumping, you might not like this. And then the highway is almost covered with them. The big trucks go roaring by here. <coughs> mashing them on the highway, and so you can smell the stench of Mormon crickets as they, their migration continues. We get into Boise, and it's time to get the car washed. We go through a car wash, and then we'll go on to Costco and see if they'll make good on their guarantee for that tire since it's a punctured sidewall. What a nice car wash as we slowly move through and get underway within a little bit. And I didn't have to word a thing. After we had our tire fixed in Boise and gave the car a well-needed washing, it's back to the camp to where we're camped and we find the squirrels are super hungry today so we've got to break out a bag of unsalted peanuts and feed them and so we it was getting too easy for them we thought they'd get so fat they wouldn't be able to crawl down their hole so we decided to take a piece of dental floss and tie that peanut down and just see what kind of luck the little squirrel has at figuring out how to get that, that peanut off there. And it is a chore. Those peanuts are getting harder and harder to get. And so he's getting quite flustered about it. 
He deserves an A-plus for effort because he's not given up. He's studying the thing very carefully and trying it from all angles, even chewing a little off that. Maybe if he chews enough off, it'll slip away, which it very well did. It pretty well wore us out, helping that squirrel get that peanut loose. So we better go up to the hot springs and rest a little bit. On the way, we see a young, fuzzy-headed hawk setting high on a rock. We meet an old friend at the hot springs, and we decide to go down and check out some of the old homestead ruins. They're about four or five miles upstream along Willow Creek, where these old homesteaders worked so hard. This was a chimney on this first one we stopped at, right on the edge of Willow Creek. What a nice place. And we think this homestead house was built a sod. They called them the Soddy. The chimney is all that's left standing, and it was in one of the corners. High above where the shack was, we see a cliff with a cave, maybe cut in there by man, to use for maybe for shelter or maybe for storage. Whatever it was, it was still standing. I'll get a picture of him. Uh, get back in the, uh, the back left corner. Well, she's got some string up there if you want to get a leash. Whereabouts is he? Uh, in the back, in the back left corner. Didn't, he didn't spook on me because he never even, never even rattled, but the colors look right there. Oh, that's one. Yeah, that's a rattler. Yep, it sort of looked like one. Yeah, there he's, he's coiling. Yeah, he's a good rattler. Yeah, you're a mean rattler. Max, you're a good dog, but we didn't want you monkeying with a rattlesnake. Hey, help. No. 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 Sit down. He was a nice... There's a snake here, Max, and we got to watch you. It's the same one, Phil. Is there another one? No, nah, it's the same one. You seen? No, but it's... I couldn't tell on the sound at first whether it was coming from that same hole or if it was coming from where to the... Oh, the you hear it? Oh, yeah, it was just rattling, but it's back in the hole. It must still be inside the wall. Oh, he must have a hole in the... Yeah, I don't even hear him. Yeah. Right, he stopped again, but... Yeah. If you no. want to hear him, he'll probably... Hey, no. No. There. Oh, he struck at it, too. Yeah. Wow, if that were a dog's nose... Yeah, he's, he's rattling good. They rattle and hiss both, you know. Yeah. Well, he's up here. That hole may come all the way to the outside. definitely come through to the outside. So. Yeah. Oh, isn't that a neat chimney? Yeah. Uh, very well constructed. These ruins are the remains of a homestead that dates back to the last century. Jasper B. Duncan, a bachelor of Willow Creek, and his brother constructed the building sometime in the very late 1800s. In 1890, they sold the property to Henry Miller, owner of the White Horse Ranch, and a major force in Southern Oregon history. White Horse Ranch, located about seven miles north, is still a working ranch. And just BLM besides that. Yeah. Probably so. That's, that is quite a... Uh, that's a pack rat Quite a nest in there, isn't it? Yeah, the darn pack rat. Somebody burned it out a few years hey, ago, hey, but it's back again. Pulling that twine hurts my fingers, dog. And I'm more, I'm more worried about there being a snake over here before I let you get back in the shady area. See how these oh, windows are? Really in, yeah. Yeah, are canted in, and it could be to let more light in, or maybe could be, or they could have for defense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
And see, you can see where the roof went and part of it rested on yeah. the main beam rested there and then it would have been a sawed roof. Made of sawed. Yeah, out here I'd imagine sawed is what they would have run with. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they did. And see, it's got even a piece of iron in there to hang pots on. But, but it is all, it's all sawn lumber that they're using to frame stuff out. Yeah, so apparently there was a sawmill someplace, and we haven't figured out what these sticks are in the wall. We oh. thought at first maybe it was to drive nails in to maybe hang clothes on. Maybe it's reinforcement. But, yeah, but it's, it's not... Maybe it's, they hung pots on it. Could be, they could have hung something, or maybe yeah. they just had a sense of style, and they just thought yeah. that it would look nice. It would nice. look nice. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm going along with what you're yeah. saying. But see, the, the, those are... They've had the door box oh, there. That saw number there. That's that piece there is. And well, I guess the, I, I guess the rest of it is too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But see, this is sawed lumber up here. Again, that's the same style. You'd you'd probably lay a board across yeah, here. Across to make your metal. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then you could use it to keep door has a little cant on the outside, and then. The door buck fit in here that the door was attached to, but... They said there's a uh, cellar over here, huh? Max, come in. Yeah. yeah. Come here. Come here. Come here. This was probably their outhouse, and the cellar's right down here. We came here one time, and I took a bunch of pictures of the old rattlesnake here and anyway I went on and then on the way back I was going to get him again and I couldn't find him and Marge knew right where he, he was just laying right back there she knew where he was and wouldn't tell me she was having fun watching you try to find him <laughs> yeah and I never did find him but right here is where where he lives uh, and this was just a small root cellar. It probably went a bit higher than this yeah. and then had sod over the roof. Yeah. That's the way ours was on the ranch. That's a, that's a small one. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. A little more. Oh, I don't want your tongue on my water. I don't want your tongue on my water bottle so much. Okay. You're just sitting there, huh? Yeah. He's not gonna fly away? Oh, there I go. Right there, hold on. Is he in the nest? No, they're just sitting there. There's two of them. Yeah, two of them. Oh, so there's, 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 a, there's enough of a ledge there. There could be a nest. I don't see branches. Though. Yeah, but a crow's nest isn't as big as a yeah. raven. And I'm not sure a crow uses the same nest each year like a raven. There, he's sitting up above it. See, they're, they're right straight below. See right there. Oh, there. I see him. There's two of Sitting them. Sitting right on the cliff. There's two there on that little ledge. On that little so ledge. So there's four here. And we only As we move along, we see a fourth homestead house over against Willow Creek. This one we think was much older. And so it uh, is a little bit different and has no chimney or fireplace in it. On the next cliff is another raven's nest with some ravens setting high up on the cliff, just watching. From the other side of the cliff, we look across and see the homestead shack again. And now we're back at camp, checking things out. And we've got to start getting some of that fencing done, whether we want to or not.
It needs to be done. But before we get too involved in that fencing, we need to go down to McDermott and see about some petrified wood. So we'll head for McDermott. And on the way to dig the wood, we saw a big, mean-looking black wolf along the road. Marge tried to get his picture. That's what all that picture taken was about. But I guess she must have apparently missed him completely. This new camera is very difficult to find things in. Disaster Peak is standing straight and tall across from us as we head over almost to Disaster Peak to find us some of that very precious petrified wood. It's some of the best here found any place on this earth. There, we have to go through the gate. And bounce and rattle down a little two-track road for a way. Now we've arrived at the spot where we'll be digging, and so we'll get some tools out and start in. Looks like an old badger's been digging here. Wonder if he dug up any wood. Looks like a piece here he dug out. Yeah, there's a small piece of wood. Badger wood. Trying to dig down where he left off. After about two hours of digging, it went real fast. We each have our 25 pound limit, so it's time to go. We noticed some buckwheat flower in bloom just before we ford the creek again and head back toward our camp. I'll let Marge drive again while I mess with the gate. I guess I'm not the real cowboy or I would do the driving and have her mess with the gate. But maybe she's got one of her lady acts on today where she thinks she can't handle the gate. Sometimes she'll do that. Shortly after the gate, we look out across the grassy hill slope and here's a little group of horses, and I'm not certain about those. They're either domestic or wild horses, and I can't really tell, but they all look like good horses. I kind of have a suspicion that they're domestic horses because I see no foal in with them. It looks like all adults at this point. On the way back, we really need to go to the hot springs and get some of that desert dust off from us. And also, I got a bucket of water and washed the petrified wood. When we get, but as we return home, the little squirrels were waiting for us. They're so hungry, they're trying to pack two nuts away at a time. And we see the little fox pup peeking his little head out of the hole. One of those squirrels said, bring him on. I want to pull his tail. That must have been the little ground squirrel's macho act. Because these little guys, ground squirrels, one of their main foods. And they're a patient hunter. They 
charge at something and grab it with the speed of light. They're really fast little foxes. I'm not sure which kind he is since he's just a pup, but I think he's honey rabbit. He doesn't want anything to do with that fox. He's just going to sit in behind a sagebrush back at our camp. Next, we go by and see the old ruins of an old long bygone Pony Express station where just the ruins of it are left. The Pony Express thing didn't last very many years, but there's still a, re a silent reminder of it. Next we see an old range cow just out switching her tail, chasing pesky flies away. But every trip over here, Marge simply has to go out and pick up some sunstones. And this is no exception. These sunstones need to be picked up. As we arrive, we find that they're shining really good in the sunlight. So I pick up some, but I've got something I need to concentrate on. Something shorted out in our pickup and blew some fuses. So the pickup's not working right. And so I need to buckle down and figure out the problem. If we, if we break down out here, I don't know how we'd ever get out of here or get rescued. It's beyond the range of most any tow truck on AAA. But we, I've finally band-aided the problem to where we could run okay. And Marge got her sunstones and s some nice big ones and some smaller ones. She wanted a few agates, so we went to the spot where these large agates are laying right on top the ground. And some of these agates have petrified wood running all the way through them. We find a few specimens of it, and all the rock you see on the surface is agates. There's some agates laying right on the surface that are so big and heavy that you can't possibly carry them. Heading out, we see an old magpie. He's pestering a blackbird. He's probably thinking that blackbird's babies would sure taste good to him. But the blackbird's not about to give in to a funky old magpie past another cliff and this is the fourth raven's nest we've seen and all the baby ravens are big enough they're flying and setting on a cliff outside the nest it's a very nice warm day it feels really good that these ravens are setting there panting. I guess those black feathers draw in all the surrounding heat as they perch on the rocks. And these part of them are the young that are hopping around on the rocks. They're flying all right, but haven't really learned to hunt yet. So they're probably still being fed by the adults as he sits on the rock and pants. As we move on by, they take to wing. I'll bet that feels pretty good to be flying up there on a nice hot day like this. I only wish that I had the ability to do that, but they have the exclusive rights to do that where we don't. In a crack in the cliff, we see the nest neatly tucked away right in a crack in the rock. And they'll use that nest year after year just 
fixing it up a little bit each year. We go back to Hot Springs, and here's a great blue heron setting up on the rock, just wanting his picture taken. We try the hot springs out, and then it's time to get back and see about those darn ground squirrels. The ground squirrels we have are the antelope ground squirrels, and you seldom see them too much. This little guy is having him a drink of water. Normally these these ground squirrels don't have to take a drink of water in their entire life. If they eat foods that, are, that have a lot of hydrogen in them and breathe a lot of oxygen, they just make up their own water and don't have to drink it. But that doesn't say they don't like to drink it because they're sure making that water dish go down. But... I've monkeyed with ground squirrels and petrified wood and sunstones enough. I've got to get some fencing done. That none of the ground squirrels or anybody's doing any fencing unless I'm here. It doesn't get done. The ground squirrels would probably like me to build a wolf proof fence here so they can keep away from that big bad mean looking wolf that we saw but he can go right through that real easily the bottom wire that we put on will put a smooth one about 18 inches from the ground because antelope definitely have the ability to jump a fence very well but they won't do it for some reason they insist on crawling under it. And so if you use a smooth wire on the bottom, then they don't get cut up. After fencing, we go back to the hot springs, and I climb up on the hill to find some, see if I can find some beaver. A beaver is swimming away. They're out trying to cut willows and bury them in the, bottom, in the mud in the bottom of the pond. That makes a really good refrigerator for it. And there goes another beaver. And so they don't have to get out and walk across the ice in the freezing cold and worry about the big bad wolf ever catching. Our next trip out, North America's fastest animal is running away from us. This is the antelope, or some people call it the pronghorn, and they're a species all their own, unique to the American West. They're a desert animal, and they are fast. There are a few animals like the cheetah and other things that are faster on a short burst, but these are great long distance runners. They can go on a run for about seven miles with speed equal to no other animal. But we're not going too fast ourselves. We've got this rutted road to deal with as we head out. The old buck antelope stands and watches it, almost as if he was saying, Hey, my legs are faster than yours, so I don't have to worry. So now it's time to go out to the playa and try our luck at land sailing. We had good wind, which died as soon as we got to Coyote Lake. So we go back and check out the squirrel and see if he's getting any smarter as he grows older. He's still after peanuts and he sure likes them, but he sure hates it when somebody ties it down. He 
trying to figure it out. He's working really hard at it, and he's taken off so fast that he's just spinning all the sand from the desert. Those peanuts are so tasty that they're well worth all the effort he's putting into it. The only thing he's trying to figure out is what in the world is wrong with this peanut. No matter how hard he pulls at it, it just won't seem to come. And they're kind of bashful little guys, so they don't want to sit there in front of us and eat it. They want to take it off and hide. But he needs a little exercise anyway, or he's going to get so darn fat. If the big wild wolf comes, he won't even be able to get down his little ground squirrel hole. I'll bet that big old bad wolf would have trotted right over here had he known there were some peanut fattened ground squirrels here. They'd have probably gone down his wolf neck real good. But this guy, he... He may be a little bit dumb. He doesn't know how to get that peanut loose. <laughs> He's sure spinning, trying. He figures maybe if he pulls just a little bit harder, it'll come loose. And he's tried everything. Pretty soon, he's going to try just eating it, though, right where it is, I believe. That seems to me like that'd be a good solution. If a peanut's caught, you just sit down and eat it right there. But he's eaten plenty of them. And they'll come over and get these peanuts and take them off and dig a little hole and bury them with the intentions of coming back and getting them later. But somebody else will find them then and dig them up and eat them. So it's a never-ending process of gathering peanuts, hiding them, and then trying to find somebody else's peanuts, and on and on they go. Well, if if he can't get him, maybe another one can. And they'll sit in the shade of a sagebrush sometimes and just assess the situation and try to figure out just exactly how to get those loose. It's a lot of work being a ground squirrel. And when they move, they move fast. That's the way a rodent does so they don't get caught. When you're out in the open, you go like crazy. And when you're going to rest a little bit, you get under a bush or something. One time when we were watching these, a big bird flew over and the shadow struck the ground. And... You didn't see a ground squirrel in sight till that shadow was gone. They know what to look out for. But this is a whole new set of situations for them. That darn peanut just won't come no matter what they do to it. And each of them has to try his own luck at it. And some of them have different techniques, techniques than others. But that one had to chase the intruder away. He was getting in the way and giving too much advice, so he needed to be chased away. Well, it just doesn't seem to be working, whatever you try. So maybe a little bit of eating on it would do the job. It's certainly worth a try. But I, he's telling the other one he needs no advice that he'll be able to handle the situation <music> Jasper volunteered to set, set high on a sagebrush and watch for the big bad wolf to see that he doesn't come Meanwhile, I've got to get back to my fencing. I'm getting behind on it. Too many distractions, and with the workload of feeding the ground squirrels and keeping an eye out for the big bad wolf, 
I just haven't got much done. But now I'm starting to make some headway. I've used up almost an entire roll of barbed wire on the fence. There will be three barbed wires and then one smooth one down below. And that's for the antelope to crawl under. Antelope definitely have the ability to jump the fence, but they choose not. They go under. So we use a smooth wire so it doesn't tear them up when they crawl under. I'm just about ready to put the smooth wire on and stretch it tight as the Steens Mountains are shining in the background. Well, we're pretty well long on the fence, so let's go down to the playa and celebrate. We're going to go down and sail a little bit on Coyote Lake. We drag the land sailor behind the pickup, and before we know it, we're down to the lake, and we've got a little bit of wind. If it'll stay blowing this time, maybe we can get a ride out of it. Now the sail is being put on the mast. There. Is it crooked? Okay. Get the rest of it put on. Okay. There you go. Wow. Wow, is it nice to be sailing once more. <clears throat> a, a brisk little breeze is carrying me along really good. And so I think I'll just go ahead and sail. Okay, here we go. As the Give wind us. howls through the mass, whip, the whipping of canvas can be heard in the background as I move out at a decent pace. And if that wind stays up like this, I'll even be able to outrun the big bad wolf. That wolf thought he was very clever, sneaking away from us without even as much as me getting a picture of him. But if I see him out here, I'll give him a run for his money. He'll be tucking that tail between his legs and whimpering by the time I start to catch up with him. It probably wouldn't take much to convince one of those ground squirrels to ride high up on the top of the mast to watch for the big, bad, mean wolf. One time... I saw a coyote out here when I was in the automobile, and so I gave chase, and the old coyote, he just walked off and left me in the dust. He headed for the sagebrush on the side of the playa, and he was gone. What a feeling to have only the power of the wind no motor running or anything. It's just the howling of the wind through the mast and the whipping of sail as we sail across at breakneck speed. The cracks on the playa howl a little bit as our wheels turn across them and move out. The afternoon sun casts a perfect replica of the sail as a shadow as some cotton candy clouds float aimlessly in a clear blue sky above. The 
the distant horizon seems to be getting closer and closer as we swoop across the playa and the Steens Mountains are standing guard with a cap of clouds over them in the very distant horizon. The cracks in the playa almost make you dizzy as they flash by you. And the only thing we see out here are a few wild horse tracks in the sagebrush on the distant horizon. We sail till we get a liberal coating of dust all over us and then sail back to the pickup and we're going to load the land sailor and head over to the hot springs and see if there's enough of that hot water to get a little bit of that good old coyote dust off from us. First we go up and watch the beavers as they sw and ducks as they swim in the beaver ponds. The beezer, beaver are out busy gathering willows for winter. They'll take them down and bury them in the mud in the bottom of the pool. Okay. And then that serves as a good refrigerator. We picked up there a you go. rock. That's Julie's rock. How it floated. Hmm. It's getting water in it. You can grab it. Hmm. It acts like it's going to sink. Yeah. Grab it. Our fence is finished now, and it's time we have to start hitting. Heading home, we see three old satellite stallions standing at attention as we go by on our way home. They've probably been kicked out of the herd, and so they're just standing out here eating all they can and looking. Maybe another day they'll be tough enough to fight their way back to being a stallion in the herd. But for right now, they're perfectly contented just standing watching us go by.